And I gave this warm up problem. I'm going to go ahead and run through it quickly, and then we can talk about what, sh what we should go over today. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to try with any limit problem is to just plug the number in. Because as long as we don't get zero over zero, we're probably done. So if I plug in three, three squared is nine minus three min mm, that's right. I wrote a zero over zero problem because I can. Zero over zero says go do some algebra. And the kind of algebra that I'm gonna do here is factor. So the top is gonna factor as x minus three times x plus two. Um, just a little like, okay, there it actually comes from the Euclidean algorithm and like fancy upper division math stuff. But if you get zero over zero, it means there had to be a common factor in the top and the bottom. So if you are someone who the factoring doesn't come quickly, just know that if you got zero over zero, then whatever's on the bottom is a factor on the top. That usually makes it pretty fast to find what the other factor had to be. Well, now that x minus three over x minus three, that's a big fat one. If I plug the three in here, I've got three plus two or five. So that's the final answer for my limit. While some of you were still coming in, there was a request today to talk about um, vertical and horizontal asymptotes, which makes sense to me since those are more, we're gonna do both of those with limits. So I wanna start by just thinking through some numbers stuff for a moment, and then we'll be able to attack those vertical and horizontal asymptotes a little bit better. Um, so I'm labeling this, uh, instincts with numbers. Does anyone know who the richest person on the planet is at the moment? Is that Bezos? I don't actually know. Can we pretend it's Jeff Bezos? Elon Musk, I don't, I think Bezos has more money than Musk, right? I don't know, okay, so, so, so let's say that Jeff Bezos, for all intents and purposes, relative to the amount of money in my bank accounts, has an infinite amount of money. Does anyone know how many kids he has? I don't even know if he has children. Let's just pretend for a second. He's got four kids. So if we took his basically infinite amount of money and divided among his four children, they're all still really rich. Now on the flip side, let's say that I found um, a $5 bill on the ground, look at me, I got five bucks. <clears throat> and I was like, you know what? I really wanna share that with everybody at Davis today. Now, if I take my $5 and I try to share that with everyone at Davis, I know this one an infinite number of people, but bear with me. If I take that $5 and I try to share it with everybody, how much money does everyone get? Yeah, nothing. You're getting nothing. Um, these two limits are super important in terms of thinking about asymptotes. There are two more limits that are slightly harder to reason through that also show up with asymptotes. And one of those is, well, what the heck do we do when we have infinity over infinity, right? If I've got an infinite amount of money divided by an infinite number of people. This one just gets weird. And you know what? It's whispering to us the same thing that zero over zero is. This one means go do some algebra. Um, 
Oh, so in the in the Zoom chat, this is a good question. Like going back to why the infinity divided by four is still infinite. So infinity isn't like a number, right? But this is saying that I have some huge number and I'm dividing it by four. Well, even if I had a huge number and I divided it by a hundred, it would still be a huge number. What it means when we're talking about horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes are asking, and I'm just gonna use HA for horizontal asymptotes, so I don't have to write so much, but horizontal asymptotes are asking, what's the long-term behavior or the end behavior on a graph? So what's happening on the edges? So let's say that I had something like y equals four over x. Now let's make it eight over x. If I want to find the horizontal asymptote, one option would be to graph this thing and to demonstrate where the horizontal asymptote is. But calculus style, what we're gonna be asked to do is to demonstrate this with a limit. And specifically, if I'm looking for the horizontal asymptote, we're looking for what's the limit as X approaches positive infinity and what's the limit as X approaches negative infinity. Most of the time we can get away with doing this just once for both positive and negative side. Sometimes we gotta check both sides separately. I just err on the side of caution and I check both, side, both sides separately always. In terms of the amount of work that you need to show for this, let whatever your instructor did be your guide. I'm going to default to what the book would show, which is when we do a limit problem, the first thing we try is to plug it in. So if I plug this in, I would have eight over infinity. Now there's a problem with this equal sign because I can't actually get to infinity. So notation-wise, one option is to just turn this into an arrow. Now, eight divided by infinity, if I had eight of anything and I divided it into an infinite number of little pieces, each piece is zero. Now the positive negative thing, that just would change this to be like a negative zero. Negative zero isn't a thing. Positive zero, negative zero, they're the same. This is zero. That means that I would say that the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Now I've always thought that this was a little bit backwards. But our horizontal asymptotes, the equation of it will always be a y equals something because y equals graphs are horizontal lines. When, we're talk, when we talk vertical asymptotes in a second, those are always going to be x equals something graphs because that's the equation for a vertical line. Most of the time, our horizontal asymptotes are not going to be that obvious. So let's go back. I don't know if this is exactly, oh, I, mm, I don't know if I have exactly the problem we worked on the other day. I'm just gonna make up something similar and say f of x is equal to two x over five minus three x. I don't think that's exactly what I had, but good enough. If I want to find the horizontal asymptote here, then that means we're going to take the limit as x approaches infinity. But this time, when I take the limit as x approaches infinity, and I'll do the negative infinity in a second, but I'm just going to start with the positive infinity. And I've got 2x over 5 minus 3x. Well, the first thing that I would do with the limit problem is to try plugging it in. 
Well, two times infinity is, um, I don't know, still really big. Three times infinity is really big. And if I take five minus that, it's still infinity, it just happens to be negative. It might be tempting to think that infinity over infinity, that those are like magically gonna cancel out, but they're not the same infinity. That top one was two times something, the bottom one is five minus three times something. So they're not the same infinity on the top and the bottom, which means we have to do some more work. So the algebra we're about to do is awkward. And there are a couple of options for that awkward algebra. One, we go back to pre-calculus skills and use polynomial long division. I don't recommend that. The next two options for awkward algebra, both involve us figuring out what the largest power of X in the denominator is. So when I look at the denominator at the moment, that single X, that's my largest power of X. And I have gone back and forth over the years about which flavor of algebra I like better. I'm gonna go with divide every term by that largest power of X. So on the top, that means I would have two X divided by X. And on the bottom, that means I'd have five over X minus three X over X. Algebraically, the reason this works is because what we're doing is we're taking the entire original thing and we're multiplying it bizarrely by, I'll just scoot my equal sign over, make that a bar, by one over X divided by one over X. And then I'm like distributing that in. So totally weird, but it works. The reason that it's helpful to do this is now I can cancel a bunch of stuff out. I can cancel out that X over X and cancel out that X over X. And now on top, I'm just left with two. And on the bottom, we're still taking that infinity as X approaches it uh, sorry, we're still taking that limit as X approaches infinity, and I still have an X in here. But now that X is really a five divided by infinity. And five divided by infinity, we're good. We know the value of that. That's headed to zero. And my answer here would be negative two thirds. And if I plug in infinity everywhere, this kind of turns into like four plus infinity plus infinity squared over one plus five times infinity squared. Well, regardless, I got some huge number on the top over some huge number on the bottom. And I know we're gonna have to do some kind of algebra. The algebra that we're going to do is to identify the largest power of X in the denominator. So in this case, that's X squared. And that largest power of X in the denominator, we have a choice. We can either factor it out everywhere or multiply it by one over X squared everywhere. Both of them work. Both are options presented in our textbook. Over time, I've kind of decided that it's usually easier to go for this version of it. So now I'm distributing in that one over X squared, or we can think about that as dividing each term by X squared. Now our objective in doing this is so that every single term in our limit 
either, at least every term in the denominator is either going to zero or some other number. Once I distribute that in, then I can simplify each of the terms. I'm gonna actually go ahead and rewrite this, simplifying each of the terms. It's kind of an extra step that you probably don't have to do. You can just do this in your head, but I'm gonna write it out. X over X squared would simplify to one over X. X squared over X squared simplifies to one. 1 over x squared, there's nothing I can do with that, but 5x squared over x squared, that's a 5. Now when I apply that limit, and this is where it's important that we have that intuition about numbers when we have infinity, that a number divided by infinity is going to 0. So 4 divided by infinity is 0. 1 divided by infinity going to 0. That 1 is still there. 1 divided by infinity is 0. And then I've got plus a 5. So overall, I'm looking at 1 fifth. If we go to find that horizontal asymptote, first thing I'm going to do is just thinking about plugging in the number or in this case, plugging in infinity. Well, I'm looking at infinity on the top and more infinity on the bottom. So I already know I have to do some algebra. I'm gonna find the largest power of X in the denominator. So that's X cubed. And then multiply by one over X cubed on the top and one over X cubed on the bottom. And again, as long as I'm doing the same thing to the top of the fraction that I'm doing to the bottom of the fraction, we shouldn't be changing the value. So I've got 2x over x cubed plus x squared over x cubed, 4x cubed over x cubed minus x over x cubed plus 1 over x cubed. It's kind of a lot of writing. You could jump straight to this next step, like not write this one, just write this one, where we're already simplifying all of the values. So 2x over x cubed, I know one of those x's is going to cancel out. x squared over x cubed, I know two of them are going to cancel out. That's going to be a 4 minus 1 over x squared plus 1 over x cubed. And just like in the previous two problems, the whole reason we're doing this is so that a bunch of those pieces go to zero. Well, on the top this time, I get zero plus zero. And on the bottom, I've got four minus zero plus zero. And overall, zero divided by four is zero. Sure. I probably could have kept that even simpler, like just x over x squared over x plus one or something. Well, when we take the limit as x approaches infinity, we would get infinity over infinity. We would find that biggest power of x in the denominator, multiply the top and the bottom by one over x. And I'm going to skip a step here, and I'm just going to go ahead and simplify as I write it. So x squared over x would be x, and then I'll have 1 over x, and then 1 plus 1 over x. So when we get to this point, we have infinity over 1. So this is going to infinity, and then I would write out in words, no horizontal asymptote. 
actually show that it's a vertical asymptote? We need the limit to go to positive infinity or negative infinity. Um, so there's two steps when we're thinking about vertical asymptotes. Let me show you what I mean by that. Um, I'm gonna keep my first function really simple here. And let's just think about f of x is equal to one over x minus two. So the first thing that I'm gonna say is, what is my candidate for a vertical asymptote? Well, we better check x equals two. So then what I mean by the limit needs to go to positive or negative infinity, the actual limit we're gonna take is the limit as x approaches two from the left and the limit as x approaches two from the right. In general, for vertical asymptotes, we should check from both sides. But even if just one side gets us to a positive or negative infinity, it's a vertical asymptote. Well, the first thing we try with the limit problem is to plug the number in. And if we plug the number in, we get one over zero, regardless of whether we're talking about left-hand side, right-hand side. Um, so I'm gonna pause for a second to have a little bit of fun with numbers. If I'm on the left-hand side of two, Someone give me a number that's just a little bit to the left of two. Like, here's a number line, here's two. Someone pick a number just a little bit over here. One's like further over, give me closer to two, like one point, sure. Let's say I take 1.9, so I'm coming from the left. I'm gonna use 1.9 for a second. Well, if I plug in that 1.9, then I would have one over 1.9 minus two. I'll do the math for us. That's one over negative 0.1. But negative 0.1 is the same as me writing that as one tenth. And dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So if I get even closer to two, like let's say I went to 1.999, then that's like negative 0. 0.0001, no, I'm off by zero, cool. We'll just make that one bigger, which is like one over, which is like, me flipping that thing over. So the closer that I get into two here, like the more zeros that I get here and the more zeros show up at the end. The closer I get to zero on the bottom, the bigger the final answer is. One divided by something really tiny is headed to infinity. And you can sit there and do this on a calculator if you want, right? But one divided by a small number is actually a giant number. Or kind of general takeaway here that you should think about is that when you get a number divided by zero, this is either going to positive or negative infinity depending on the sign of that number and the sign of the zero. I want to find all vertical asymptotes. So my first step is to figure out what are my candidates for vertical asymptotes. And the candidates 
that we're going to need to check or whatever makes the bottom zero. So I'm going to check both positive one and negative one. So I'm going to need a limit as x approaches positive one from the right, a limit as x approaches positive one from the left, a limit as x approaches negative one from the right, and a limit as x approaches negative one from the left. Finish it off together then. Um, so the first thing I'm going to try with any limit problem is to just plug it in. So if I plug in positive 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 squared is 1, and then minus 1 would be 0. So 2 over 0 already, this is telling me I know that that's going to be a vertical asymptote. But we probably should figure out whether that's headed to positive or negative infinity. The reason to do that, a couple things. One, we might just be asked to do the limits, not in the context of a vertical asymptote. Or eventually, we're probably going to be asked to graph some of these. And if we're going to graph them, it's important to know, are we headed down or are we headed up? So now I'm going to think, if I pick a number a little bit bigger than 1 and square it, then that result will be a little bit bigger than 1 which means this will be positive, and that's going to positive infinity. If I plug in 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 squared minus 1 is going to give me a 0 on the bottom. But now I'm thinking about I'm choosing a number a little bit less than 1 to plug in. So when I square that, it's going to be a little bit less than 1 and my denominator will be negative. So that's going to negative infinity. Like with numbers? Yeah, for sure. So um, let's do this one. Um, so let me choose like x equals a little to the left of one. So let me do 0. 0.9. So if x equals 0. 0.9, then and really, I just care about the denominator, right? Because I already know that the top is going to be really darn close to 2. So if I think about the denominator here, if x is 0. 0.9, then I'm going to have 0. 0.9 squared minus 1. Well, 0. 0.9 squared is like 0. 0.81 minus 1. So that's negative. 0.19. Now, without actually sticking that into a calculator, like the thing that's important is that I know that it's going to be negative. And I know that if I got this even closer, like I made that 0.99, that's the part that I can't do in my head, right? But if I'm getting this closer and closer to one, this th same thing is still going to happen that 0.99 squared is still going to be less than 1 is. So the bottom is going to be negative. And that's the important thing to show, is that the bottom is going to be negative, which means we're headed to negative infinity. Now, if you happen to be allowed to use a calculator, and for sure on the homework, like pull out a, as you're working through homework problems from the textbook and stuff, by all means, pull out a calculator, right? But on the test, the thing that's important is, can you figure out whether it's positive or negative? We don't have to know that it's, you won't have to calculate something gross. You just have to know if it's positive or negative. Was that enough? Okay, cool. Um, so now let's look at this other one. So if I plug in negative one on the top, I get zero, but I also get zero on the bottom. And zero over zero says we have more work to do. 0 over 0 says, I've got to do some algebra. I don't know if I gave myself enough space to do the algebra, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, I'm going to help myself out here and get that out of my way. 
because I actually am not gonna have to worry about the left and right hand side because we got zero over zero. I'm just gonna jump straight into the algebra there and factor the bottom. And because that x plus one over x plus one, conveniently, it's gonna cancel out for me. I'm just gonna end up with one over negative one minus negative two. And I think I mentioned this on Tuesday, but if you get zero over zero and that factor cancels out, that tells me there's a hole on the graph. So X equals negative one, it's still a problem in terms of domain. It's not included in the domain, but it's not a vertical asymptote, it's a hole. And the only way that we can tell that is by doing the limit or factoring and canceling stuff. The only calculus -y way to show that is by doing the limit. So we checked and now we know that X equals one is the vertical asymptote, but negative one was a whole. I don't know why, but our textbook really likes these functions that look like absolute value of something. I'm gonna go absolute value of X minus five divided by the same thing, but without the absolute value. Our textbook really likes this thing. Shows up in 16A, it shows up again in 16B. Books like, isn't this cool? Um. What was that? Oh, yeah. Um, yes, for, for 16A, the text, pro the, when you say homework problems, you have suggested homework problems from the textbook or you have web work? Um, yeah, suggested. Yes, exam questions tend to look a lot like the textbook questions. Um, sometimes people use this software called web work where there are more like multiple choice questions and things. You are not getting a multiple choice exam in a math class. I mean, you might have a multiple choice question or two, but it won't be a multiple choice exam. Yes, they look a lot like textbook questions. Um, so let's investigate like what this graph looks like really quick. And I need everybody to pick a number. Think of the number in your head. You can't choose five, but you can choose any other number. Plug it in and evaluate the function. Oh, I should have told you to choose a small number. Don't choose like 417. You gotta work harder for that. Okay, for the number you plugged in, how many people got an answer of one? How many people got an answer of negative one? Yeah, that's because there are only two things this can possibly be, one or negative one. You're taking something, plugging it in and dividing it either by itself or the negative of itself. So this graph turns out, looks like, well, if you pick something less than five, then this should be negative one. And if you pick something bigger than five, this should be positive one. Sometimes it's called a step function because it's kind of like you're taking a step. This function happens to not be continuous, just to use some vocabulary that we're gonna hit upon. 
because for starters, it's not actually defined at five. When you try to plug in five, you get zero over zero, but there is no magic algebra to get you out of that hole. There just is a hole at five. This thing is not defined at five. It's not a vertical asymptote. It's just not defined at five. So questions that we might be asked on this thing, maybe I'm asked to take the limit as X approaches five from the left. Or maybe I'm asked to take the limit as X approaches five from the right. Well, this, there is some algebra that we can do here. And option one might be to graph it and just show that obviously on the graph, the limit is negative one. But if we wanted to show that limit with algebra, what we're actually gonna do is to think about that absolute value graph as a piecewise function. So the absolute value of X minus five, if I plug in something bigger than five, then we already have a positive number inside the absolute value and it doesn't do anything. So this is just equal to X minus five as long as X is bigger than five. But if I choose a value for X that's less than five, like four, well, when I plug in four, then what's inside of the absolute value is negative. And then the absolute value takes the result and forces it to be positive. Well, the other way to write that is to say, we're gonna take that result and change its sign. Well, once we've written it as a piecewise function, now I can approach the limit because now I can take that limit by replacing the absolute value with the appropriate piecewise part. Since this is five from the left, or a little less than five, I'm going to take the function on the a little less than five side. Oops, that's an X minus five and get negative one. If I were taking the limit as X approaches five from the right or the side where it's a little more than five, I can replace the absolute value with the other part of our piecewise function and have X minus five over X minus five, which is just one. What's the limit as X approaches one of F of X? Now in the previous problem, we had an absolute value, which is what led us towards a piecewise function. Here we have a piecewise function to begin with. So when I'm asked to evaluate the limit as X approaches one, I have to look at, since one is the place where my limits are matching, or sorry, one is the place where my two kind of formulas are matching up. I have to investigate this from both the left and the right. So I'm gonna take the limit as X approaches one from the left. And then I'm gonna look at our function formula and say, okay, which formula do I use when I'm on the left-hand side of one? That's the place where X is less than one. So I'm gonna use the two X minus four. And then the first thing we try with the limit problem is to plug it in. So if I plug that in, two times one minus a four, so negative two. And then I'm gonna take the limit 
as X approaches one from the right. And now I'm thinking, okay, the right-hand side of one, so a little bit more than one, which formula do we use? We use that X squared plus three. So if I put one in, one squared is one plus three, I'm at four. Because we didn't get the same number, we're gonna say the limit as X approaches one of F of X does not exist. For starters, it might be helpful to know how to graph this thing. It's certainly within the realm of reasonable to ask you to graph this thing. Um, but at the moment, I really just want to know um, oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the problem. I'm going to make that a two and that a two because that's what I meant to do. So my function is x plus one for x less than or equal to negative two. For x between negative two and two, my function is just four, so just a horizontal line. And for x greater than or equal to two, my function is x squared. And I wanna know what's the limit as x approaches negative two. And what's the limit as x approaches positive two? So I get four questions for the price of two. Because it's a piecewise function, if the limit that we're investigating is a place where the, the pieces match up, that means that I have to check from both the left-hand side and the right-hand side because we have different formulas to use on the left-hand side and right-hand side. So if we do this one first, and I split this up to think about the limit as X approaches negative two from the left. So on the left-hand side of negative two, the formula for our function is X plus one. And then we plug in our value negative two plus one, I get negative one. Then we're gonna look approaching negative two from the right-hand side. And one thing to be careful about with limits is we're always talking about when we, when we say left or right, we mean like really close to the number, just a little bit to the left or right. So if we're talking about negative two, it's true that two is like way off to the right. But we want to be pretty close to negative two, which means we should be looking at that middle part of the function here. And there isn't anywhere to plug in the x. The value just is four. They don't match. So this limit does not exist. Let's see what happens when we try two. So I know this got a little bit messy here, but um, I have this piecewise function with three pieces in it. And the function is defined to be equal to four for any X value between negative two and two. So there isn't anywhere to plug in an X that just is the value of the function. Um, so it's X plus one because we're looking for what's the sort of formula for the function when I'm on the left-hand side of negative two. So on the left-hand side of negative two, the formula for my function is X plus one. When I'm between negative two and two, my formula is four. And when I'm bigger than two, my formula is X squared. So if I look at this limit as X approaches positive two from the left, on the left-hand side of positive two, that formula is four. 
And on the right-hand side of positive two, the formula is x squared. So here I do have somewhere to plug in the x. When I plug it in, I get four. So to the right, no, it's, it's because I wrote the middle one backwards. I wasn't trying to throw everybody off. I just happened to have written the middle one backwards. Yeah. So because these match, we can say that the limit as X approaches two of F of X is equal to four. Okay. 